Um, so I would like now to turn over to my colleague, Romy Ruckel, who will be uh, facilitating and introducing uh, the final panel, which is, uh, as David just suggested, to go on and think about policy considerations. So we've, we've had a little bit of a journey from you know, challenges and opportunities to teaching strategies, and now we're thinking uh, larger and thinking about policies. So over to Romy, thank you very much. Thank you, Deb. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, sticking with us for this uh, last section. It's going to be a little different than what we've been doing before, um, including thematically, right, as we move to talk about policy. Uh, admittedly, I will uh, still have some nightmares about replica now that I've looked that up. Um, but, um, but that's an interesting transition to think about you know, how quickly things move and the kinds of uh, trust and relationships people are looking for, right? Something that uh, Professor Hom also discussed. And so now we move to thinking more about what kinds of policies, best practices, um, even provisional policies can we have in place as we move with the change or can we even do that as uh, uh, Sarah Matson Hardy said earlier, right? Do we have the kind of agility uh, what kind of agility do we have to be able to respond? So joining us uh, in this conversation are Matt Parfit, Associate Professor in the Rhetoric Division uh, in the College of General Studies. Uh, he is the author of several books, including he's currently writing a book called Teaching Writing in the Age of AI. And uh, Wesley Wildman, uh, who is a professor of philosophy, theology, and ethics at the School of Theology and in uh, computing and data sciences. And as this dual appointment suggests, um, he is a philosopher of religion and a data scientist specializing in the scientific study of complex adaptive social systems. Um, it is such a treat to uh, hear from both of these folks, uh, and especially Wesley, uh, after this, I, I really want to hear about your, your book, your recent book, uh, Spirit Tech, The Brave New World of Consciousness Hacking and Enlightenment Engineering. Um, so with that, both uh, Matt and Wesley are going to present um, for a little bit. And then we're going to do something different than the Q&A session in that there are slips of papers on your tables. And we would like you to write down your questions as you are listening to our panelists and pass them to the students who currently have the microphone. So they are changing in their roles from handing over microphones and uh, uh, bringing over the questions instead to me. And then I will choose which questions will get asked. Um, uh, and of course, we will not get to all of them. But one of the benefits of uh, for our units in getting the questions in writing is that then we can actually follow up with you and uh, think through some of these questions that you have to get uh, that we have um, together. So without further ado, um, here's Matt, and don't forget to write down your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Romy. Thank you very much, Deb and Maud and Lisa and everybody else who was involved in getting this together. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, learning with AI and policies. Uh, this is a hard question. ChatGPT, I think, is just the beginning in, in two senses. Uh, first of all, text generators have actually been around for a little while now, since 2020 when GPT-3 was released as an API. An awful lot of um, apps have been available uh, that allow text generation, but they're pretty much all subscription-based, and so they didn't get the kind of press that ChatGPT got as soon as it was released a few months ago, I guess November, and, uh, uh, excuse me, and so um, I don't know if you're aware of these, but for example, Jasper, Copy AI, or a couple of the uh, text generators that are being used pretty widely already in industry. Um, and in another sense, too, ChatPT is just the beginning in that uh, OpenAI uh, recently released an API for ChatGPT, which means that it can now be implemented into uh, software apps of many, many different kinds. So we're going to have all kinds of different uh, uh, versions and, and capabilities built on top of ChatGPT. Uh, it's already integrated into Bing, as you may know, Bing Chat. Uh, Google released BARD earlier this month, or just a week ago maybe, to very little fanfare. 
Um, but if you think about it, Google has access to an awful lot of data, and so that has pretty great potential. Um, and, you, and Microsoft and Google are both planning to integrate uh, text generation into their, uh, their office suites and other apps. So we're in a period of very rapid change, period of transition and flux. And uh, uh, if we write policies, I suspect that we'll have to rewrite policies every year, every semester, for the foreseeable future. Um, so that's part of what I feel like I'm, I'm dealing with in talking about policies at all here. So what's the future of writing? I think in many ways the future of writing is different than it has been. Um, it's not a simple question because writing isn't a, isn't a simple thing. It's a highly complex, highly differentiated activity and writing as a product is a highly differentiated thing as well. Um, the AI we have now, the large language models like ChatGPT is very, very good at some kinds of writing. There's a lot of relatively utilitarian, relatively perfunctory writing uh, you know, I'm thinking of documentation and marketing and uh, legalese of various kinds, instructional writing, uh, where authorship isn't particularly prominent, it's generally hidden anyway, uh, that I suspect GPT or text generators are already being used for and are going to be used even more widely in the future and in the workplace that many of our students are going to be entering. Um, I think probably text generation is going to be a pretty standard tool used, used widely. Um, then, of course, there's another kind of writing where authorship is very important, where uh, we have something to say. We want to say it in our own way. Uh, maybe we want to learn by writing, and, uh, and, it, and, and we don't want AI to take over uh, in that kind of context. Um, I think most policies are aiming to safeguard that kind of writing. So how should we prepare students for this future that, that, that's coming? Um, I think in many cases we perhaps need to instruct them about how to uh, use generators like ChatGPT effectively uh, for the kind of somewhat perfunctory or utilitarian writing that they may be required to do. Um, in other situations, I think we need to uh, give them instruction about how to use text generation effectively for certain phases of the writing process, perhaps uh, research, um, perhaps brainstorming, outlining, uh, or, or simply um, editing. Uh, there, the, you know, what it means exactly, what, the, what we should be preparing students for, I think at this moment can't really be known, but uh, I don't join the 30% of instructors that David was talking about earlier who want to just ban GPT. I, I don't think that's realistic. Uh, it seems like the majority of us here don't really think it's realistic either. I think we do need to keep up with developments uh, in writing and research software. Uh, maybe not all of us, but we need to have uh, leaders, experts in our departments, uh, in our professional organizations who can be a vanguard and, and kind of show the way. Um, and I think we need to be ready to work with uh, these apps uh, rather than resist them. So what I've been kind of looking at in terms of policies is, is tools that can write with us uh, rather than for us. And just to give two very quick examples, um, both of which could be used to write for us, but I think are intended more to write with us. Um, there's a little thing called Compose AI, uh, which puts a little dot into uh, a Google Doc or, or other apps, your email. Um, you click on the dot and you give it a prompt, uh, such as the top one there, um, and it will return three suggestions uh, to complete that prompt. Pretty useful for certain kinds of writings. I've been writing, rather, I've, I've enjoyed using it in some contexts. And then Gram Grammarly Premium, uh, which you may be aware of, and soon Grammarly Go, um, which I think are worth mentioning because Grammarly is widely used by our students, whether we know it or not. Um, and, and, you know, not perniciously either. Uh, they're using it to identify errors and correct errors in their writing. Um, but Grammarly Premium and Grammarly Go 
are, are sort of shifting things over to that writing for us rather than writing with us in the sense that Grammarly Premium will rewrite your sentences. If you have it rewrite enough of their sentences, it becomes detectable by these AI detectors that are around, rapidly becoming obsolete, but they're around. Um, and uh, a student's work having been rewritten to a sufficient degree by Grammarly Premium could get flagged by one of those detectors. Grammarly Go is full on text generation. It'll produce the text for you. So, you know, there's, there's a, a wide spectrum here between tools that write with us and tools that write for us, but I think Grammarly is more intended to be a tool that writes with us. I think that's true of Compose AI as well. But they keep on coming, and this is a, a short list of the AI-powered writing tools that I know about. Um, I've used about 30 of these. I know of about 50. I'm sure there are more out there, and I'm sure there are more coming. Uh, so these do all kinds of different things, and by no means are they intended to be, um, I don't know, kind of uh, under the radar uh, uh, tools, that, uh, plagiarism tools, or anything like that. These are um, uh, well-developed sophisticated, in some cases quite expensive tools um, that will write a full text for you um, or will simply help you out in various different ways. Jasper is one of the best known, I think, and, and it's the one that I've probably used the most. Um, it overcomes some of the shortcomings of a chat GPT or a GPT-3 by giving you templates that allow you to produce much longer work. So you can produce a, a full-length chapter or, or even an entire book using something like Ch Jasper just by having it step you through the stages of text generation. So, um, and some of them are, are really very legit. Uh, Jenny, for example, and Consensus and Rightful are Actually, I haven't even got consensus up there. Um, but these are uh, intended for academics, uh, intended to help us with research, intended to help graduate students with, uh, or, or, or uh, academic writers uh, with the research and writing process. I think we have to think of it as a learning tool as well as a simple text generation tool. Um, Bill Gates uh, wrote a blog uh, a few days ago um, in which uh, he emphasizes the, um, that the age of AI has begun, he says, and uh, he kind of zooms out and tries to put the developments of the last few months in a broader perspective, a historical and global perspective. He calls this moment revolutionary, but mostly a positive development, um, accelerating gains in productivity, medicine, and education. And with regards to education, he says, that I think in the next five to 10 years, AI-driven software will finally deliver on the promise of revolutionizing the way people teach and learn. It will know your interests and your learning style so it can tailor content that will keep you engaged. It will measure your understanding. Notice that when you're losing interest and understand what kind of motivation you respond to. It will give immediate feedback. The first thing I thought of when I read this was MOOCs, these you know, huge edX type courses uh, that made a big splash a few years ago. And of course, the number of people who actually finish a MOOC course is tiny in comparison to the number who start. And I wonder if with the availability of ChatGPT and other text generators, if that number might be much smaller and it might begin to sort of level out the, the, uh, the, the, the educational opportunities that are available in the way that MOOCs originally hoped to do. Um, on the, uh, um, on the open AI, open AI being, of course, the company that built ChatGPT, on their blog when they announced GPT-4 recently, they gave an example of a Socratic tutor that I thought was very interesting. So they prompted ChatGPT to act as a tutor, a Socratic tutor, and not give the answer, but only kind of uh, help the user to solve a problem, which in this case was a quadratic uh, equation. And it did a great job, at least you know, in the blog, I wasn't able to test this much for myself, of simply um, prompting the user to push through with its uh, suggested answers through to finally a correct solution to the, hydro, uh, the quadratic equation. Um, and I think you know, that's part of the possibilities of, of a chat GPT to, to, to be used as a Socratic tutor. Um, 
Certainly, as others have suggested, you can prompt it to explain a concept X at a grade nine level or something, and it'll do that. So it can be a great learning tool. So with regards to policies, finally, I think that one of the questions that we have to cope with is how much help is too much help? Um, and that's not an easy question to answer as these uh, tools are developing and changing so quickly. We have, um, I don't know how many of these I'm going to be able to quick, uh, click through to in the time available, but, um, well, maybe not, maybe not the publishers. I'll, I'll ration myself a bit here. Elsevier, Nature, Cambridge University Press are three publishers who have already come out with policies uh, around the use of AI. Um, and they basically come down to two simple rules. Uh, don't try to pass off text generation as your own work. If you do use text generators, ChatGPT or similar, acknowledge your, the way that you've used them. Um, and classroom policies, and I have to thank Sarah Matson Hardy for pointing me to this document. Uh, this is a shared doc that a number of instructors have contributed to uh, with classroom policies uh, that they have developed. And so we've got quite a few here. And I've been reading through them as carefully as I can. Um, I won't try to summarize them in any detail, uh, but I will say that again, we have this common thread of don't try to pass off text generation as your own work. If you do use text generators, acknowledge how you use them. But we also have this enormous gray area in the middle. And I would say that reading through these, uh, my sense is that in general, it depends a lot on the kind of course, what ways the instructor imagines GPT might constructively be used in the development, in the completion of an assignment for that course. In some courses, it's clear that a text generator can be used very productively, and in others, uh, it, it really is not clear how it can be used uh, productively at all. And so there seems to be an enormous range in there. Uh, going back quickly to the slides here. Yeah, how much help is too much help? We also have um, uh, policies that have been produced by the Association of Writing Across the Curriculum, the University of Maine, the University of Delaware, the University of Maine, whoops, where am I going here? Wrong one. Uh, the University of Maine has an interesting site on their uh, teaching and learning organization, uh, Learn with AI, and they have various pathways for learning with AI. So that's a slightly different approach, different policies rather suggesting how instructors can use AI productively. I have a modest proposal to end up with. Um, in thinking about the difference between utilitarian writing that GPT does very well and the more authored writing that GPT doesn't do very well, my mind was cast back to the feminist epistemologies of the, 18, of the 1980s and 1990s and their view that knowing comes from a subject position, from a particular context, a particular position in society, um, and that that ought to be integrated into academic writing. And I think maybe this is an approach that we can use as we rethink our own assignments and even how academic writing should look for students, maybe even for ourselves. Maybe the knower as situated in a particular time and place, a particular context, needs to be more prominently visible in our academic writing not just because that's harder for GPT to produce or imitate, but also because I think students will then be more invested in their writing, more excited about their own writing and what they're expressing in their writing, and perhaps less inclined to use uh, ChatGPT as a result. So uh, I'll just end on that note and that thought. Uh, I think my time is up, um, and it's a little tangential to the question of policies. Uh, but that for me is kind of what I've been thinking about a lot lately is how we can sort of situate the knower more prominently in their writing so that it's less likely that ChatGPT will simply be able to create that, uh, that product for a student instead of writing, uh, instead of being a tool that they use to write with them. All right, thank you very much.
Greetings, everyone. It's really thrilling to be with someone who has an Australian accent. Where are you, Deb? There you are. It's good to see that you're all interested in this topic too. It is kind of catching us off guard. And uh, to recall what Sarah said right at the beginning, it's not clear that a university is naturally built with the kind of agility needed to respond to something like this with the, <laughs> with the appropriate speed. But the fact that you're here and you're thinking about it, I think is a good sign. So uh, when I asked my students in the ethics of computing and data sciences class at the beginning of this semester what they cared about here, this is what they told me, please don't pretend that generative AI tools don't exist. We need to figure them out. This is going to be a part of our life forever. Don't just ignore them and don't abandon us. Right? We need to figure this out. And don't let us damage our skill set by giving us these short-circuited methods for cheating. We need this skill set to thrive and please help us figure out good ways of building it despite the fact that there are these methods here that can help us write and help us draw and help us create audio and music and video and every other thing. Don't ignore cheating because we're competing for jobs and we don't want people who cheat to get the jobs that we deserve because we actually invested in learning. And don't be so attached to your old ways of teaching you insane professors who are attached to your pedagogies that were formulated hundreds of years ago. Come on, update. They wanted me to, they wanted me to know this, right? This is what they cared about. So with that in mind, we tried to develop a policy to speak into this policy void, which seems to be the kind of policy void that grows deeper with every month. They came up with a policy you can get to from that the Gaia policy, it's called Generative AI Assistance Policy. It's drafted for text generation, but something like it could be used equally well for other kinds of generative AI. And as has been said, that students should give credit and they should say precisely how they used AI tools. That means actually provide an appendix and in the appendix actually give the exchanges they had with the AI, highlight what was important to them, explain how they used it, document the mistakes they found, and get credit for fixing those mistakes. And faculty should understand AI tools, how they work. The, these are sentence completion algorithms and they're incredibly complex, but we need to understand how they work ourselves from a slightly technical point of view, even if we're not technical people, so that we can understand how they could be used and um, they want us to use AI detection tools as well. Uh, I do think they're going to be obsolete pretty soon, but at the moment GPT-0 is pretty decent at detecting AI-generated text with high probability, but there are enough false positives that there's a real worry that students, especially who use English as a second or third language, who use uh, more wooden syntax, who use simpler vocabulary, are more likely to get pinged. Uh, for uh, AI-generated text. So it's important for the students themselves to use these products before they submit them. Our course software is developing AI detection, AI writing detection tools that's going to be built into originality reports. So that's good, but they themselves are deeply worried about false positives as well as false negatives. It's a problem. We really have to be careful. This is not your grandmother's plagiarism, is it? It's definitely not. We used to be able to show that someone took writing. Now it's a probabilistic judgment call. Denials are difficult to, to refute. It's going to be complicated. But the students are saying, we want you to do that because that's a part of trying to deal with the cheating issue. I also want fairness in grading, penalised thoughtless or unreflective use of AI tools. So uh, we're going to have to update policies regularly. It's going to be difficult. Stuff's going to change so quickly. The key to the change that we're seeing right now is that T in GPT. It's the transformer technology. It's a particular type of technology that allows deep learning uh, neural nets to be far, far more efficient than was the case in the past. That kind of breakthrough causes a massive surge in technological proficiency. That kind of breakthrough is going to be repeated again and again. You don't know when exactly, but a year from now or six months from now, there'll be some other similar algorithmically spectacular breakthrough. So this policy void is going to continue to remain complicated. We have to stay agile. 
Now, I want to take you back a long, long, long way. Short-range policy has to do with dealing with emergencies, but long-range policy thinking asks you to think really deeply about what you're trying to do as a teacher. Now, you know what our species is about. We're a tool wielder. We're all about extended cognition. We use objects from outside of our bodies to enhance our ability to handle our environments, to preserve knowledge of how to navigate over long distances, uh, through conversations and stories to figure out the plants and animals in our context. We're very, very good at using objects and other things to extend our cognitive powers. We've always done that. For millennia, we learned how to think through movement, through objects, through stories. We do that just fine. We haven't significantly changed our cognitive powers from a genetic perspective in, those, in that period. So people just as smart as us were trying to figure out how to understand their environment 15,000 years ago before there was any writing. But the invention of writing allowed elites to expand their thinking powers using text. So people started using that particular type of object, text, language, to immeasurably increase their ability to recall things, their ability to organise their ideas, their ability to make arguments, to stabilise legal systems. Pretty much everything you can think of was transformed by the invention of writing, but really only for elites, until the printing press came. And at that point, the ability to extend cognition through writing became virtually universal. And now almost everyone on the planet can read and write not everyone, but almost everyone. And that widespread literacy means that we become used to thinking about writing is so fundamental to our way of thinking and our way of knowing that we've become deeply dependent on it in our pedagogies. But the longer history of our species is important to remember. We didn't always have writing. And we were learning to think really, really well when we didn't have it. So I think printing-led pedagogy to consolidate around learning to think through writing. These are the sorts of things that mattered to us. Effortful gathering of information is one part of it. Effortful evaluation of information, weighing what's important and what's not. Effortful formulation of a central point. Organising evidence, structuring an argument, and then figuring out how to convince people, how to communicate, how to illustrate your points. All of this stuff, generative AI does a lot of those things really well and it's getting, really, it's getting better really quickly. If anyone says, don't worry, generative AI is not going to be able to do X, humans will always be needed to do that, I don't think that's a good bet. So that's the nature of this policy void. It's just going to keep getting deeper and deeper and broader. So uh, that's a problem when our pedagogy uh, is set up around learning to use, to think via writing, we're backing ourselves into a corner and we're just leaving it to others in the future to make the correction. What kind of correction's needed? I think we need to teach students how to think using many modalities. Through writing and reasoning, yes, of course, but through calculating and coding. There are whole branches of our university that don't use writing very much anymore to, f to teach students how to think through verbalising and debating, which has become sort of slightly minimised relative to the way it was at one point in our learning systems. Expressive art and music. I mean, just read Plato's Republic to see how much, how important he thought uh, that expressive art and music uh, was for teaching students how to think and how to understand. Using devices and querying, fortunately that was mentioned in the first panel, it's incredibly important. Also in the second panel, that the problem of trying to figure out how to query devices is an art form. It's incredibly difficult. And uh, this requires a kind of empathy for machines, which, by the way, uh, people with autism spectrum disorders tend to be very gifted at. The ability quickly to understand how a machine works, what a machine can do and what it can't do, figuring out how to coax out of the machine what you want. In other words, it helps to solve the infamous problem of alignment between human intentionality and machine intentionality or capabilities. So those generative AIs, including GPTs, they can be assets for this kind of education. They can create new and shifting baselines for students to target and exceed. 
So I guess the, the overall point that I'm trying to make is that we have to do both. We do need short-term policies to plug gaps when we've got policy voids, but we also need to recognise when we're dealing with a policy void that's getting bigger, we need to rethink deeply what we're trying to do as teachers. What matters to us? What are we trying to convey to our students? It's not just a body of knowledge, surely. Surely not that. We are trying to teach them how to think. But are we trying to teach them to think using a single modality that we actually don't need to use? Well, surely we've learned from STEM disciplines and from the dramatic arts that we don't need to teach people to think only through writing. So I think there's some areas of the university that are already ahead of the curve on this and other areas that are just catching on. Our dependence on writing as a pedagogical method has to loosen. We have to accept that writing is going to be a specialised kind of skill, a little bit like coding. It's going to be the sort of thing that some people do really, really well and other people are just going to use help. They're going to get help from machines to help them write. So I'm asking you to think short term with regard to policy and then long term with regard to your deep goals as teachers, because that's where the creative juices are really going to get moving. That's where the transformative effects of your genius as academics is going to affect the way our students learn, the way they fashion their lives and their careers. Don't forget, they told me straight out, I believe they'd tell you the same thing, they're counting on us to solve this problem. It matters to them that we understand their future and that we teach them in accordance with that understanding. Thanks. Thank you so much um, for those very provocative presentations. Um, we've received a number of really fantastic questions, and um, I want to get to so many of them. Happily, uh, after this, there's a roundtable discussion that you get to have with your your at your table. So. Um, you get to, if, if the questions don't get asked or answered right now, um, you are encouraged to discuss them with your colleagues. I will ask two questions in the interest of time um, so that we have time for you all to talk to with each other as well. And the first one um, comes from Matt. Um, and it's to both of you. Uh, and I think you started uh, a little bit, I mean, both of you have, have touched on, on some of the, the limitations and how to, um, how to broaden our own thinking and understanding around pedagogy around this. This question is um, because we know that so much of AI has known cultural and racial biases, um, what issues do you see with these biases to be aware of as we introduce generative AI into our, into our teaching? Well, um, yeah, the, the, so the, I think this goes back to um, a, a question that was raised earlier about how does ChatGPT know what it knows? And it knows what it knows uh, from its training data sets primarily, but then it's also uh, aligned through human feedback, and and I think OpenAI, for example, ChatGPT is uh, developed by OpenAI. I think they're working very hard to uh, correct the biases in the training data set. So, in other words, if um, a, a crawl of the internet is about 60% of uh, GPT's training, there are going to be the same biases that we find in the internet in GPT responses. And then you can identify those biases and try to correct them. I think those are, that, that kind of work has been going on and is gonna continue going on. And frankly, personally, I'm, I, I, I can't get that worried about the biases. It's still gonna hallucinate and make things up. And I think maybe that's the, the bigger problem over the long term. I don't know if you'd agree, but um, yeah, I mean, that's my, my first thought about, about that particular issue. Each week in this ethics class I mentioned we do a case study of a real world disaster that cropped up, an ethical disaster in the AI uh, world. We're often dealing with bias and it's very interesting to see the way biases accrue. I think the single most critical thing we can do is to make AI processes more transparent so that they can be subject uh, to, to the uh, 
the kind of auditing that is able to detect exactly why a problem arises. At the moment, auditing is possible but extremely time-consuming and people need to do better at facilitating auditing quickly. Uh, that will produce the kind of feedback, economic feedback and also uh, policy level feedback that will cause the problem of bias to become more of a self-correcting aspect of an economic system. Uh, however, there are also unregulated uh, chat, uh, chatbots of various kinds that are specifically cultivated to be biased. Uh, they are uh, not, they don't go through the sorts of things that uh, G Bing Chat and ChatGPT have gone, the content moderation and so forth, they don't do that at all. In fact, people celebrate the fact that they're free to say whatever they want. Uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of such chatbots that have been used in misinformation and disinformation campaigns. It's almost endless, the number, many more than is known, and the, one, the numbers that are known amount to the hundreds and hundreds. So these are specifically leveraging bias in data sets to create uh, misinformation and disinformation. So it's a, this is a perilous situation. It's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse because mischief makers have access to these APIs and they can train on whatever they want. Can I throw in one more thing? Um, back to OpenAI and ChatGPT. OpenAI was pretty open for a while. It stopped being open. It's really not very open at all about how GPT-4 was trained, about uh, you know, what processes go into uh, improving GPT-4 over GPT-3.5 or GPT-3, the, the one that came out in 2020. Uh, w w as academics, I think we need to get behind the, uh, the openness of all these, these AI companies, but also open source uh, initiatives as well, like um, Eleuther and uh, Bloom, I think is the other big one, but, but ones that are basically nonprofit uh, by academics, for academics. Maybe others here know more about them than I do, but. Great. Um, I'll ask one more question. I think that will then lead very well into the table conversations. Um, it might seem mm, a little fundamental, but I think I was intrigued by it. Um, which is, you know, to, to go back to where we started from in terms of talking about slide rules versus calculators or um, something, um, uh, an analogy I have been using around, uh, you know, the advent of uh, Excel spreadsheets, right, and the kinds of calculations that they allow us to do more efficiently versus doing them by hand or something like that, right? Um, why do we need to disclose the use of AI at all? Um, this is a question that comes from Questrom. Uh, we don't forbid students to use calculators, right? We don't request their disclosure. We don't do that with a number of other tools that people have been using as, acknowledge, as, um, as analogies. So why is AI different? If we're treating it also as just a tool, which is also the biggest word that came up in the word cloud. It's a tool, it's just a tool. Well, since CDS has a policy that's built around uh, disclosure, I should probably say something about that. I don't think this policy is going to last very long. Uh, the concept of disclosure is necessary at the moment because of the way we're thinking about using writing to teach people how to think. But that's going to shift pretty quickly, I believe. And uh, so uh, just we want students to be honest about what influences them and where it's not understood what those influences are, we want them to cite clearly what they are. That moral principle applies right now to what we're doing in most of our writing. But in the long run, that could easily change. We, with What we take for granted could shift. And when that happens, then uh, we will stop citing uh, uh, generative AI just like we won't cite the use of a calculator to run a sum or something. No? Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for that. And so with that, we'll um, move to the next part of, of this section of today, which is that you get to chat with each other a little bit. Um, I will note that one of the questions passed up here was... Um, uh, 
traced its lineage back to that it was generated with the help of ChatGPT. Um, so I don't know if you're inviting ChatGPT into your table conversations, um, but but one of the questions came up here that was from that. None of the ones I asked, but just, just to let you know. Um, so for this next part, um, I think the question that you, you will be discussing will be up here. Uh, what policies are you considering for generative AI in your courses, uh, in your learning spaces? Um, and our wonderful panelists are going to move around the room and also uh, participate and listen in a little bit um, so that when we move to the report back, uh, we have a sense of where things got really juicy that would be uh, interesting to bring up for the rest of the group. So uh, take a deep breath, stretch, and uh, dig in. We're going to call on a couple of tables to share. We were walking around and, uh, and picked up some interesting nuggets. Um, and we're going to call folks to share. Uh, I can tell that everyone's really eager to talk because I'm having a hard time getting over the, the noise of the room. So uh, that's good news, I suppose. Um, so Matt, Wesley, and I will each kind of call on a table where we heard some really interesting things happening. Uh, and then um, we'll wrap up after that. But my first uh, question is to the table over there. I think Mark uh, Newton, uh, your table over there. I um, overheard something really interesting, which was that I, of course, was wandering around and, and listening to people talk about kind of policies that we think students, we should have for students, right, around the use of AI. And something that really caught my attention about your table is that you were talking about what kind of policies you, as academics, <laughs> might want and need <laughs> around use of AI. Um, and I'm just kind of wondering how that came up and, and kind of where you, where you landed from there. Thanks. I don't know if we got too much into the policy question, but we were uh, we were just sharing stories of having used these GPT-enabled tools to create efficiencies in the consumption of the academic literature. It will do amazing things. There are tools like Readwise where you can put a 200-page National Academies report in, say summarize and give me uh, give me questions about this text. Um, is that is that a more useful approach to consuming large amounts of literature than to just consult the uh, the author's executive summary or abstract. I think that's kind of what we were talking about. Yeah, so I thought that that was interesting that, you know, there was, um, when we talk about by, by policies or guidelines, um, so much of the initial thought goes to, okay, what, what do we provide to our students or how do we sort of, um, you know, navigate student relationships with generative AI. And so what I found potentially quite provocative on uh, your table was this thought of what do we do what are our guidelines? Where are our parameters? Um, one of the, uh, I'll say this as a, as a last thought before I, I turn it over to our colleagues, but um, one of the things that I keep thinking about is, right, that there's a lot of fear around, oh gosh, AI and, and you know, AI consciousness will break out and what will happen then. And I'm actually much more concerned about what happens when we break in uh, rather than the AI breaking out. Uh, in terms of kind of what what is possible for us and, and do we need some guidelines and support around how to navigate this landscape. So I know Wesley is going around and, and gathering some nuggets, but Matt, did you want to um, highlight somebody that or a table that you saw and, and sure. listened to? Um, the, the first is, I, th I, th I think your name is Jonas, but I, I don't know your last name. Yes, Goldenberg. Goldenberg, yeah. Uh, we were talking at that table about Turnitin um, and I thought that was a useful uh, sort of uh, uh, point to touch on, I guess. Um, uh, I'm sure that Turnitin is very eager to develop software that will uh, detect uh, text generation. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I guess what I find interesting about it is that we can only speculate right now about whether in a few months, in a year or so, that that's going to be possible or not, whether detectors will be able to keep up with uh, the tools. Um, I, I'm just going to throw in this from my, you know, personal anecdote. Uh, a few weeks ago, even, yeah, before GPT-4 came out, when it was GPT-3.5 or GPT-3, I was, uh, I, 
I, I, I was putting a lot of my outputs from GPT through uh, one of several different detectors. And they were not 100% reliable, but they were pretty good. I'd say you know, 80% of the time, they were able to distinguish human created output from, uh, from AI. Uh, with GPT-4, they became almost useless, and interestingly, with this tool, Jasper, even before GPT-4 came out, they were pretty much zero detection uh, was possible. So there's something that the AI is doing now that is foiling the detection tools, and, and maybe that just means the detection tools have to catch up with something, or, or maybe it means that the whole project is futile. I don't know. But all of this sparked by this conversation about Trinity. Do you want to add anything to? And I'm just, I'm just shocked that there's not more faculty here from our school uh, because uh, other than, I mean, uh, and what Hayuk and I were saying was everybody has blinders on, and I don't know in other schools or other departments, but, um, you know, it's uh, out of sight, out of mind, and uh, there's a lot of people who are just uh, heads in the sand. And I'm, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to share this with my boss, who's the, uh, you know, associate dean for academic affairs, um, you know, uh, and say, hey, this is really, really important. She was the one who suggested I come, so mm -hmm. here I am, and I'm, I was interested in that stuff anyway. But you know, it, it's the fact is, I, I'm more nervous about students using it and me not knowing than I am about me using it and sharing, sharing it with them at this point. And I was shocked that there are 50 now, and that, which means that there's way more than 50, uh, and that um, whichever one of you brought that up already mentioned one that's not even on the list. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, yeah, it's way, we, no, way I, no way normal people can keep up with that. And, and most and of us are normal people. Since, so. since we live in capitalism, there 100% will be AI detectors that they can charge us for, right? So they'll charge us for the AI use and then the detectors, right? So they can bill us twice. As uh, as our educational technologist colleagues and I were talking, like that's that's also inevitable, right? So we can be billed twice. Um, but Wesley, you have the, the last word. You have the floor uh, with some of your invitations and, and nuggets here. Some of you are very, very clever. So <laughs> one of the... Comments, just a little bit of humor from Mohammed Sultaniha. He said uh, five years ago, he's been for five years he's been running these open internet exams and the rule is you're not supposed to speak to any humans and you're not supposed to speak to any bots either. And he's been making that wisecrack for five years and all of a sudden he finds out that this wisecrack is actually needs to be turned into a policy in order to be able to keep, keep doing his own exams. Well done, Mohammed. <coughs> Uh, at the back uh, there, Ashley Moore uh, made the point that uh, computer-assisted audit trails for essay production would be quite useful. If you could actually write your essays and have versioning that sort of tracked so that you actually uh, create a documented record of how you use generative AI and how you push back against generative AI would help the grading challenge. But uh, Shannon Peters over here made a deep point about ungrading. I mean, the, the whole system, if you're competing for jobs, the whole system is built towards uh, getting good grades so you can get a good job, so you can get a lot of money, so that you yada, yada, yada. That's the whole way it works. And this is the sense in which the university plays into the hands of an economic system that makes university learning not a matter of cultivating skills and developing the virtues that you want citizens to have, but more a matter of preparing for specific kinds of careers. That's fine if that's the way the university wants to operate, but it builds in an incentive structure that means that people will cheat if they can because of the good stuff that they're going to get if they succeed. So how about de-incentivizing that move so that you can actually invite people to learn how to teach in such a way that they wouldn't even want to use generative AI to do that? That ought to be a possibility, except it requires such a comprehensive rethinking of the economic position of universities in the large-scale global economies that it might be a bit more like a pipe dream. But my goodness, if we have to rethink what we're doing at depth, then this is certainly one of the issues we should be thinking about. That, that is a fantastic last thing to end on. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, thank you so much to both of you for, for playing and, and chatting with us. And uh, I'll turn it over to Deb um, to wrap up this uh, symposium this morning. Thank you all. <laughs> Uh, folks, actually, I'm going to turn over to um, Associate Provost Christella Rockus, but I just had a couple of things um, to uh, to close out the uh, teaching and learning aspect of this. This has been, for me, an extremely um, exciting and invigorating um, uh, event to participate in, both in terms of planning, but also just to be here and hear all this discussion. And I think we are really looking forward to continuing the conversation uh, with all of you in the room and with folks beyond. And I just wanted to say as well, I think, you know, the, the thinking about technology and working with technology, how, I guess, delighted I was to see the CDS policy named the acronym GAIA because it, it was just, it's such a sort of serendipitous or, you know, synchronous with the sort of Greek mythological word to describe the origins of life and earth and, and just that sort of sense that, the technology doesn't rule us. You know, we are learning to work with it and, and making choices in its development. So I think, um, and I just also, I guess in connection to that, um, something from the University of Maine that uh, Matt referred to, prioritising humanity. So these are the things that I, I think, there were many things that really took away, I took away from the conversations and the presentations today, but also so many more things to think about and as we go on thinking about how we as humans continue to work with technology. And then I will turn over to Chris to, for his closing comments. Thanks so much, everyone. Wow. These were some of the fastest three hours <laughs> in my life. I mean, this event really flew by, which is a testament to how exciting and how excited everybody was in the room. So uh, I would like to thank everybody who participated for their insights. I would like to give a very special thanks to this, my team at uh, DLNI and CTL for the hard work they put in organizing this event. I mean, thank you. It was, uh, we did it very quickly. Uh, and I know how hard everybody works, so thank you very much. I think everybody appreciates uh, your efforts. <laughs> so I, I was delighted to see how much thinking and innovation and experimentation is happening at BU around ChatGPT. Uh, this is great, and this is only going to continue. Uh, I think everybody realized that this is a very much a work in progress, that what we know about ChatGPT today will be different from what we know and what we think about it next month uh, will be different from what we know in three or six and 12 months. So uh, when it comes to what, where we go from here, it will be an ongoing process uh, that we need to do together, right? I especially um, appreciated the views and policies that both of you articulated short term versus long term. And one thing that Perhaps I want to emphasize again is that ChatGPT is not just a tool for teaching and learning. It's a tool that's gonna change the world of work at large and the place of us as humans in the world, right? And so which means that in the long run, it's going to change the sets of skills and competencies that will be relevant for humans, which will fundamentally change what we as teachers will need to do, right? So. It's not just a question of preventing students from cheating in, in the current set of uh, assessments with the current set of skill sets. I mean, those things will change in, at some point. It may not be cheating at all using ChatGPT, but we just have to find out what's the new role of humans in this brave new world that is unfolding upon us. So, okay, in terms of immediate steps, the one thing that, that is very clear is that our community you know, needs m both guidance and more opportunities for ongoing interaction and deliberation. Uh, and part of the role of this event is to get some input from us, for, for us, uh, in order to be able to help uh, and support this. So one thing I wanna point out is we, won't be, we will be sending a survey tomorrow, right? We'll be sending a survey tomorrow and one, one particularly important question in that survey are you're collecting your thoughts about what you think that Boston University could and should do to support you 
in the coming months, right? Uh, in terms of all questions around ChatGPT. So I would really appreciate it if you give it some thought. I will take your input very seriously and I uh, will deliberate uh, together, uh, take in everything we've learned today, everything we've heard today, and come up with uh, initiatives and, and other um, uh, resources that we'll put together to support the community. So with all of that, uh, I don't want to keep you from your lunch any longer, so thank once again to everybody for your contributions, and I look forward to continuing our discussions and collaborations in the future.